The Existence and Attributes of God by Stephen Charnock on Spiritual Worship, Part 4. Fifthly, and therefore God never intended that sort of worship to be durable and had often mentioned the change of it for one more spiritual. It was not good or evil in itself. Whatsoever goodness it had was solely derived to it by institution, and therefore it was mutable. It had no conformity with the spiritual nature of God who was to be worshipped, nor with the rational nature of man who was to worship. And therefore he often speaks of taking away the new moons and feasts and sacrifices and all the ceremonial worship as things he took no pleasure in, to have a worship more suited to his excellent nature. But he never speaks of removing the gospel administration and the worship prescribed there, as being more agreeable to the nature and perfections of God and displaying them more illustriously to the world. The Apostle tells us it was to be disannulled because of its weakness. A determinate time was fixed for its duration, till the accomplishment of the truth figured under that pedagogy, some of the modes of that worship, being only typical, must naturally expire and be insignificant in their use upon the finishing of that by the Redeemer which they did prefigure, and other parts of it, though God suffered them so long, because of the weakness of the worshipper. Yet because it became not God to be always worshipped in that manner, he would reject them, and introduce another more spiritual and elevated. Incense and a pure offering should be offered everywhere unto his name. He often told them, he would make a new covenant by the Messiah, and the old should be rejected, that the former things should not be remembered, and the things of old no more considered, when he should do a new thing in the earth, even the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of his presence, and the glory of the Lord in that nation, should not any more be remembered and visited, that the temple and sacrifices should be rejected, and others established, that the order of the ironical priesthood should be abolished, and that of Melchizedek set up in the stead of it, in the person of the Messiah, to endure forever, that Jerusalem should be changed, a new heaven and earth created, a worship more conformable to heaven, more advantageous to earth. God had proceeded in the removal of some parts of it, before the time of taking down the whole furniture of this house. The pot of manna was lost, Urim and Tumim ceased, the glory of the temple was diminished, and the ignorant people wept at the sight of the one, without raising their faith and hope in the consideration of the other, which was promised to be filled with a spiritual glory. And as soon as ever the gospel was spread in the world, God thundered out his judgments upon that place in which he had fixed all those legal observances, so that the Jews, in the letter and flesh, could never practice the main part of their worship, since they were expelled from that place where it was only to be celebrated. It is 1,600 years since they have been deprived of their altar which was the foundation of all the Levitical worship, and have wandered in the world without a sacrifice, a prince or priest, an ephod or teraphim. And God fully put an end to it in the command he gave to the apostles, and in them to us, in the presence of Moses and Elias, to hear his son only. Matthew 17 verse 5 Behold a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And at the death of our Saviour testified it to that whole nation and the world by the rending in twain the veil of the temple. The whole frame of that service, which was carnal and by reason of the corruption of man weakened 
is nulled, and the spiritual worship is made known to the world, that we might now serve God in a more spiritual manner and with more spiritual frames. Proposition number six. The service and worship the gospel settles is spiritual, and the performance of it more spiritual. Spirituality is the genius of the gospel, as carnality was of the law. The gospel is therefore called spirit. We are abstracted from the employments of sense and brought nearer to a heavenly state. The Jews had angels bread poured upon them. We have angel service prescribed to us, the praises of God, communion with God in spirit through his son Jesus Christ and stronger foundations for spiritual affections. It is called a reasonable service. It is suited to a rational nature, though it finds no friendship from the corruption of reason. It prescribes a service fit for the reasonable faculties of the soul and advances them while it employs them. The word reasonable may be translated word service, as well as reasonable service, an evangelical service, in opposition to a law service. All evangelical service is reasonable, and all truly reasonable service is evangelical. The matter of the worship is spiritual. It consists in love of God, faith in God, recourse to his goodness, meditation on him, and communion with him. It lays aside the ceremonial, spiritualizes the moral. The commands that concern it our duty to God, as well as those that concerned our duty to our neighbor, were reduced by Christ to their spiritual intention. The motives are spiritual. It is a state of more grace as well as of more truth, supported by spiritual promises, beaming out in spiritual privileges. Heaven comes down in it to earth, to spiritualize earth for heaven. The manner of worship is more spiritual, higher flights of the soul, stronger ardors of affection, sincerer aims at his glory. Mists are removed from our minds, clogs from our soul, more of love than fear. Faith in Christ kindles the affections and works by them. The assistances to spiritual worship are greater. The Spirit doth not drop, but is plentifully poured out. It doth not light sometimes upon, but dwells in the heart. Christ suited the gospel to a spiritual heart, and the Spirit changed the carnal heart to make it fit for a spiritual gospel. He blows upon the garden and causes the spices to flow forth, and often makes the soul in worship like the chariots of Aminadab, in a quick and nimble motion. Our blessed Lord and Saviour, by his ease, discovered to us the nature of God, and after his ascension sent his Spirit to fit us for the worship of God, and converse with him. One spiritual, evangelical, believing breath is more delightful to God than millions of altars made up of the richest pearls and smoking with the costliest oblations, because it is spiritual, and a might of spirit is of more worth than the greatest weight of flesh. One holy angel is more excellent than a whole world of mere bodies. Proposition number seven. Yet the worship of God with our bodies is not to be rejected upon the account that God requires a spiritual worship. Though we must perform the weightier duties of the law, yet we are not to omit and leave undone the lighter precepts, since both the magnalia and minutula legis, the greater and the lesser duties of the law, have the stamp of divine authority upon them. As God, under the ceremonial law, did not command the worship of the body, and the observation of outward rites without the engagement of the spirit, 
so neither doth he command that of the spirit without the peculiar attendance of the body. Thus Valksandians denied bodily worship, and the indecent postures of many in public attendance intimate no great care, either of composing their bodies or spirits. A morally discomposed body intimates a tainted heart. Our bodies, as well as our spirits, are to be presented to God. Our bodies, in lieu of the sacrifices of beasts, as in the Judaical institutions, body for the whole man, a living sacri sacrifice not to be slain as the beasts were, but living a new life, in a holy posture, with crucified affections. This is the inference the Apostle makes of the privileges of justification, adoption, co-heirship with Christ, which he before discoursed of. Privileges conferred upon the person and not upon a part of man.